Currently I am working at uh, Cranfield University and there I'm the uh, director of the Institute for Environment and Health and we have uh, uh, interest there in all aspects of the interaction of, of the environment on, on people's health. Uh, my particular research interests for, for many years have been looking at uh, air pollutants and particularly those in the indoor environment. When we think about our own ways of living, nowadays increasingly we spend more and more time in buildings and in enclosed environments. So if we want to consider what we are actually exposed to, we also have to think about where we are, when we are breathing, for example, when it's air pollution. So in that case, we can analyse and see that people really are spending well over 80% of their time in buildings. A very large part of that is in their homes. And particularly if we're thinking of the most vulnerable people who would be perhaps the newborn, the elderly, and all of us when we're sick, we'd be spending 100% of our time indoors. So against that background, it's good to understand, therefore, what is the exposure that occurs when we are in that indoor environment. And we use these rather technical terms of the very volatile compounds, the volatile organic compounds, and the semi-volatile to try and describe um, what is effectively many hundreds of chemicals that may, that may be present. And one of the uh, things that uh, has been considered in a number of people who have looked at, at whether indoor air is becoming a more significant issue is to consider you know, our lives perhaps before the 1950s and, and our lives now, and just to consider the, the, the huge amount of new materials that we are now uh, placing in our homes, be it as the, our televisions and our computers, and our man-made fibres instead of our woollen carpets and, and the changes in paints. You could describe everything just looking around a room, which means that, that, that we are in a whole sort of new internal environment in many ways uh, from, from what was experienced by, by perhaps our grandparents. And, and so that is one of the things that people are considering, well, is this presenting new risks that, that we're not actually familiar with in the past. If we look at any room, such as the one we're, we're, we're in uh, in this meeting room today, we, we have the benefit of, of, of many materials, for example, the carpets and the furniture, the painted walls. We're all, we're all very aware of the, the odour that can be created when they are new, if, particularly if we're doing uh, do-it-yourself painting, etc. But after you have that initial emission, we also have a much longer-term emission going on of chemicals, for example. So that is one particular source. Then there are our activities. Uh, we may be cooking, and of course we're aware um, not only of the burnt toast issue, but the, uh, the fact that we have combustion fumes, perhaps if we're cooking by gas. And indeed, we may have cooker hoods to try and remove some of that type of, type of source. And then we also have our cells to be sources. We may smoke indoors, tobacco smoke, etc., which uh, we may uh, use all sorts of air fresheners and, and toiletries and that sort of and cleaning products. And all these add to the uh, potential for contaminants in, in our indoor environment. And so largely, if you look, there are many pollutants where both the concentration indoors is higher than outdoors. And also when we think about the amount of time we spend indoors, combined with that, it's clear that the indoor environment can be a, you know, a very important part of our total exposure to, to air pollutants. And then there are a wide range of compounds where the concern is perhaps that, that they are also irritants. And there, I suppose it would be well to pick up on the example of the, the fact that we have been concerned perhaps over, particularly since the mid-70s, of the, the considerable increase in, in the cases of asthma, for example. So typically in Europe there is perhaps 10% of the population affected by a doctor-diagnosed asthma. Um, 
20% figures in the UK for certain child groups. And whilst the, the science of knowing whether such uh, chemicals play any role in the causation of asthma, it, it is quite well established that they can uh, promote the symptoms of, 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 of an asthma sufferer. And therefore, it can certainly be of the benefit to those if such uh, exposures to, to chemicals are, are limited. And so I think on, on that basis, as well as the fact that it plays a role, I think as well as our, our, our an actual disease of how our perception of the indoor air as to whether it's stuffy, uh, as to whether it's odorous, to whether we, we feel comfortable, maybe thick-headed. And the, these are, are types of effects that often describes the sort of sensory effects as opposed to irritation or disease, but they are an aspect of indoor air quality. So increasingly people are looking at whether the performance of children in classrooms where the ventilation is inadequate can affect their learning and, uh, and also in a number of workplaces as well. So that's the other sort of scale of the issue really that, that, that we're faced with and why we think that looking at improving indoor air quality can have you know, benefits to, to a lot of people in the population. It certainly has considerable potential to be effective because in the laboratory situations you have clearly demonstrated that it will react, uh, if it will absorb formaldehyde it will bind formaldehyde and therefore it will reduce the concentration uh, of that present in the air to which it is uh, in contact. And therefore it has certainly the potential to, to reduce the pollutants in that case.